It's hard to imagine how a city like modern-day Berlin, a city filled with eccentric, vibrant, artistic types, was once a city divided. Divided not by offering different opinions on which is the best seasoning for currywurst, but split straight down the middle between two super global powers, the East and the West. For those living on each side of the country, it felt like their home, and even the world would never be united again. But miraculously, the Berlin Wall started to crumble all because of one word. This proves that history can be changed by bold actions, radical change, and even typos. But we're not talking about JFK's Ich bin ein Berliner speech, which, at least for a while, was falsely believed to translate as, I am a special kind of German donut. In actual fact, he said, I am a person of Berlin. Instead, we're going to take a closer look at the famous press conference which ended the Berlin Wall once and for all. So it's time to learn how history works, to understand how history can change by accident. Let's do a quick refresher. It was the end of World War II, and Hitler succeeded in being the only person on the planet to kill Hitler. But in the wake of the end of this fierce battle came an uncomfortable realization. The temporary alliance between the Soviet Union and the West was over. The Cold War was here, and the battleground was going to be built out of bricks and mortar through the streets of Germany's capital. As part of the transition process, the capital was divided into four subgroups, as per the four occupying Allied powers, America, Britain, France, and the Soviets. Initially, there were plans for the members to work together in getting Berlin self-sufficient again. But like recently divorced spouses entering a custody battle, it just made things worse. Two groups were formed, Russia and non-Russia. The German Democratic Republic, or GDR as it's known in the streets, was created to rep the Soviets in their half of Berlin. It also attracted like-minded Berliners, people, not donuts, who liked how the Soviets installed communist governments in the countries they occupied during the war, which is how we ended up with the East and the West divide. Needless to say, some people in the East didn't like this Soviet style of governance and moved to the West. Likewise, there were people in the west side of Germany who weren't keen on running water and stock supermarket shelves, so they figured they'd join the communists. Between 1951 and 1955, 1 1.5 million East Berliners would move westward with 300,000 going the other way. These numbers would increase over the next few years until immigration was impossible and even fatal. That's because over the time, the divide widened, not just ideologically, but physically. The GDR started construction of the wall on the 13th of August in 1961. Their argument was that a 4.2 meter high wall, complete with a death strip, bed of nails, and guard towers, according to the real estate brochure anyway, was needed to keep out pesky fascism from socialist states. In fact, they named it the anti-fascist protection rampart, which doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, especially in German. Here, listen. Mauer als antifaschistischer Schutzwall verkauft. See what we mean? The West Berlin city government, on the other hand, dubbed the divide the Wall of Shame, which is easier to say, but sounds more like photographs of shoplifters on a shop's cork board. Regardless, the world's history book would come to know it as the Iron Curtain. As thin as the two walls were, they were impenetrable. Over the next 30 years, 100,000 people would attempt to escape. Only 5,000 ever succeeded, most having their immigration plans foiled. But somewhere between 136 and 200 people would die as a consequence, shot by guards or tangled in barbed wire. One of the lucky ones was Hans Conrad Schumann, an East German border guard who hopped a barricade to the west on the third day of the wall's construction. No doubt sensing that time was running out, he abandoned his post and defected. Now he has a statue commemorating him. So the next time you think about walking out on your bullshit job, remember that Hans is celebrated for walking out on his. So that's the context of the Berlin Wall, with life more or less going on this way until the 90s, well, 1989 specifically, when a series of revolutions in nearby Eastern Bloc countries put the Eastern Bloc rulers under pressure. It's kind of like hearing your neighbors argue through the wall and realizing their relationship ain't so hot. Now, the East knew that things weren't all that well in their utopia. And this, of course, was on the backdrop of the collapsing Soviet Union. The writing was on the wall, literally and figuratively, for the Eastern Bloc, but given how World War III almost broke out at the Checkpoint Charlie right after the wall's construction, aka the Berlin Crisis of 1961, there was a trepidation to ask the USSR to, you know, hurry up and throw down the towel, at least from the state level. Plenty of citizens were participating in demonstrations, and not the sort of protests you get now. Their placards didn't have catchy memes to help their selfie go viral. Things were getting serious. Things were changing. Things were heating up faster than a pizza roll in a super-powered microwave. 
When Hungary opened its borders with Austria, thousands of East Germans used the opportunity to take passage to the west side of their home city. The same thing happened when Czechoslovakia opened up and thousands more reached the West German embassy. Now the Soviets needed to stem the tide to stall their collapse, and so it was decided that they would open up more travel freedoms. It was a way to stamp out the panic by giving them a little bit of what they wanted. That was the plan anyway, but things went very differently on the evening of the 9th of November in 1989. The West Berlin government had learned that the GDR was planning on loosening its travel laws. This was big news. The GDR rarely did press conferences. It was like seeing Blink-182 announce more tour dates. People were in shock. Egan Krenz, the general secretary of the Socialist Party, told the Minister of the Interior to give him proposals because they don't want to destroy the wall. But a draft had hastily been put together because the Czech Communist Party got on the phone and said that if East Germany didn't open up their border soon, then they will close theirs. It's the country equivalent of your date saying, hurry up and get here, or I'm leaving. So in the heat of the moment, a team of four decided that anyone with a passport could leave, but those without, which was most of East Berlin citizens, could go the next day and get one immediately. Let's recap that to make sure you are paying attention. The GDR didn't want to fall, so they decided that you could travel if you had a passport. And if you didn't have a passport, you could apply for one starting the next day, and when you applied, you'd get one immediately. Seems simple, right? So the committee agreed. The press release was typed up and it was handed to Gunter Schabowski, the newly minted public relations minister, to read out. The thing is, he was just told to read it. He wasn't privy to the ins and outs of the proposal. In any case, he was sent off to the press conference, where he spent the first part giving a boring talk about what we have to do as a party, what we do if there's a party conference, blah blah blah. Then he remembered he was given this piece of paper, so he reached into his pocket and read it out. Suddenly, the press conference picked up. Now the journalists were wide awake and desperate to know more. Like restless children on a long car ride, they kept asking, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And when, when, when? And it's here that history changed. Here, Shabowski did not say, from tomorrow, they change and you will get a passport immediately. Instead, when asked, when do they change, he looked up from his paper and said, immediately. This was on live TV broadcast across all of East Germany and everyone had heard him say it. Citizens descended on the wall like it was Black Friday and the Nintendo Switch was back in stock. But the guards didn't let anyone through. At first. Because when the crowds got bigger and the chaos got crazier, the guards buckled. Proving they had as much authority as a substitute teacher on a field trip to a chocolate factory. By now, West German news programs were reporting the news of open borders, which caused Western citizens to flock to their side of the wall. From here on out, people dismantled the wall with hammers, not sickles, and just like that, the wall fell. And without the fall, there was no need for the GDR. And without the GDR, there was no need for a divided Berlin. By March of 1990, free elections were held. By June, the East had adopted West German currency, and on October 3rd of that year, East Germany ceased to exist. 30 years of oppression and division fizzled out all because one guy said a single word wrong at the time. It makes you wonder, what would have happened if JFK really did say, I am a donut? If you've ever said the wrong thing at the wrong time, let us know in the comments below. But maybe saying the right thing now may be the wrong thing to say 100 years from now. Go and watch our video on what historians will hate about us in 100 years. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe to keep on learning how history works.